Hi, it's Katrina. Battle of Visby This medieval Battle of Visby was a violent affair that left behind an archaeological legacy of slaughtered soldiers with their chainmail and armor, guns and knives still sticking out of them. The scene is quite terrifying, even all these hundreds of years later. In 1361, farmers living on the Swedish island of Gotland went head-to-head -head with Danish forces, who fought under King Valdemar IV of Denmark. Determined to subjugate the people of Gotland, the greedy king arrived on the island with a professional army and marched to the town of Visby. The king had heard rumors the people here were singing songs making fun of him, and they were a threat to his trade routes, so he held a personal vendetta against them. Along the way, they were confronted by Gotland's farmers, who tried and failed to stop the army's advance. The warfare raged on as Valdemar's forces continued along their planned route, with the final battle happening beneath the wall that surrounded the town. Gotland's residents were intent on standing their ground. So much so that even children and elderly people joined in on the fight. But they were no match for the invading troops, and ultimately surrendered. Over half the island's farmers, around 1,800, died in the bloody encounter. The victors hastily buried the dead in mass graves, which archaeologists have excavated over the last century. In addition to human remains, they have uncovered fascinating artifacts, including armor and weapons unique to Gotland. The items left behind from the Battle of Visby offer a rare glimpse into medieval warfare techniques and the living conditions of the time. The soil here left everything extremely well preserved, including armored gloves and bits of clothing. Meanwhile, human bones tell the individual stories of Gotlanders, who suffered gruesome deaths at the hands of the Danes. The Battle of Bunker Hill From the very beginning of the American Revolution, victory seemed anything but certain for the colonists who sought to break free from Britain. They were less trained, strapped for resources, and outnumbered for much of the war. But these ragtag forces believed strongly enough in the fight for independence to persevere, even when the odds were clearly stacked against them. One of the first major skirmishes between the colonists and the British, known as the Battle of Bunker Hill, happened on June 17, 17 1775 in Charlestown, Massachusetts. By then, tensions between the parties had reached a fever pitch. While the rebels readied for war, the British prepared to respond to an uprising. The night before the battle, the Patriots began to fortify Breed's Hill outside of Boston. Their goal was to prevent a British attack, but their actions provoked the enemy to launch an assault. As King George's troops marched up the hill in formation, the colonists withheld gunfire because they didn't have enough gunpowder. They were saving it for the last possible moment. Finally, the militiamen began shooting, and they successfully repelled two British advances. But the Redcoats weren't giving up, and on their third charge at Breed's Hill, the rebels finally ran out of gunpowder. Hand-to-hand -hand combat ensued, and the British won, but their victory came at a cost. They had expected to quell an unruly mob, and were surprised to see how organized and determined the colonists were. Nearly 300 of the king's soldiers died, and another 800 were injured. In comparison, the Patriots lost 140 troops, and around 260 were wounded. And they continued refusing to back down as their rivalry with the British escalated from disagreements to full-blown war. The Battle of Zama Hannibal was a general from Carthage who commanded his forces against the Roman Empire during the Second Punic War. You may remember him from his war elephants. Known for his tactical prowess, he's considered one of the greatest military leaders of all time. But while Hannibal was widely regarded for his incredible battle tactics, he wasn't perfect. Hannibal finally met his match at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC, when his army came face to face with Roman troops led by General Scipio Africanus the Elder. At the time, Carthage increasingly faced the threat of defeat by the Romans, who had recently invaded Africa. Hannibal was called back to Carthage from Italy. Along the way, he gathered 37,000 troops many of whom were inexperienced when it came to fighting the Romans and with warfare in general. In the meantime, Scipio approached with the same number of men and a 6,000-strong cavalry that was vastly superior to the Carthaginian forces. Knowing he was at a disadvantage, Hannibal met with Scipio and tried negotiating a settlement. But the Roman general rejected the offer, and the fight began the following day. Hannibal released 80 poorly trained elephants onto Scipio's well-organized maniples, who were trained to move aside as the animals charged through. 
the Roman cavalry attacked the weaker Carthaginian cavalry, causing them to flee, and Scipio's infantry crushed Hannibal's soldiers. When the Roman fighters became exhausted, they received backup from the cavalry, which swiftly defeated Carthage's most experienced troops. Around 20,000 of Hannibal's soldiers died, and another 20,000 were captured. The Romans only lost 1,500 men. Their victory marked the end of the Second Punic War. The Carthaginians were harshly punished and never regained the strength to challenge the Romans. The Battle of Stalingrad World War II's biggest and bloodiest confrontation began in August 1942, when Axis forces launched air attacks on the industrial city of Stalingrad in southern Russia under the command of Adolf Hitler. He then sent soldiers on foot in hopes of conquering the Soviet Union. Hitler was interested in seizing Stalingrad because the city was a major production center for war materials. It was also located along the Volga River, which served as a primary shipping route. By taking control of Stalingrad, Hitler and his army would be able to cut the Allied forces off from this vital supply source. He also saw it as a propaganda opportunity to gain power over a city that was named after Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. The fighting was brutal, and it went on for months, culminating into one of the bloodiest battles in recorded history. Stalin urged his forces not to retreat at any cost, and soon enough, the Soviets found themselves at a shortage of troops. They began recruiting volunteers, even though they couldn't even provide a weapon to each fighter. Their resilience paid off. Realizing that the German military was unprepared for the frigid Russian winter, the Red Army launched a campaign against the Nazis, capitalizing on the enemy's poor preparation and intelligence operations. The tables turned and the Axis forces began to wear thin. Hitler stubbornly refused to surrender, even as his troops starved, ran out of ammo, and suffered in the bone-chilling cold. The Soviets ultimately managed to stop the Germans from advancing any further into the USSR. They paid an immense price for the victory. An estimated 1.1 million Red Army soldiers died or were injured throughout the six-month ordeal, and around 40,000 civilians lost their lives. But the victory boosted Russian confidence in the ability to win the war and marked a major turning point in the Allies' favor. Many historians regard the Battle of Stalingrad as the beginning of the end for the Nazis. The Battle of Muye Around 1046 BC in ancient China, the rebel Zhou state stood up against the forces of the reigning Shang dynasty. The Zhou tribe had grown in recent years and was gaining power. Its previous leader, King Wen of Zhou, had started to entertain the idea of overthrowing the Shang dynasty and seizing their land. King Wen never acted on this vision, but his son and successor Wu did. Determined to fulfill his father's wishes, Wu gathered 50,000 Zhou soldiers and they began marching toward the Shang capital of Yin. Around 170,000 slaves defected from Shang Emperor Di Xin and joined Wu's troops. This served as a major blow to the Shang army's morale. As a result, many soldiers refused to fight, and some even joined the Zhou. They placed their spears upside down to show that they too did not want to defend the corrupt Shang dynasty. The battle raged on, and the Zhou troops proved superior to Shang's forces. They were better trained, their morale was high, and they mercilessly refused to back down. When King Wu broke through Shang's defense line in a chariot charge, he forced his adversary to flee. All the Shang soldiers left behind quickly fell into disorder and chaos. Zhou forces emerged victorious. According to the historical record, they caused enough bloodshed that there was enough blood to float a log. The Siege of Orléans English forces laid siege to the city of Orléans, France from October 1428 to May 1429, during the Hundred Years' War. At the time, England's power against the French was at its peak, and the war was in its later stages. The English knew that if Orléans fell, they could probably conquer all of France. The French military had not seen a major victory since before 1415, when it suffered a crushing blow at the Battle of Agincourt. This losing streak continued for the first six months of the siege. Toward the very end of the ordeal, a teenage girl, famously known as Joan of Arc, traveled to Orléans after hearing voices telling her to help the French win back the throne. Dressed in men's clothing and accompanied by a small army, she entered the city through its eastern gate while French troops distracted the English on the western side. Joan brought desperately needed reinforcements and supplies, and she also reawakened a fighting spirit among the French. She led several 
several battles during which she was struck by an arrow. After bandaging her wound, Joan went right back into the fray, helping to secure a French victory. The English left Orléans the following day. This fierce female warrior continued leading the French into battles for five more weeks, and they repeatedly won against the English. The French recaptured the city of Rheims, and Joan knelt at Charles VII's feet when he was crowned the King of France. D-Day On June 6, 1944, 156,000 Allied troops stormed the coast of Normandy, France in a mission to free the country from Nazi control. Famously known as D-Day, it was the largest seaborne invasion in recorded history. Thousands of paratroopers were behind enemy lines by dawn. They were followed by amphibious attacks by U.S., Canadian, and British forces. By the end of the day, the Allies had successfully taken Normandy's beaches. Over 4,000 soldiers died, according to some estimates, with American casualties alone numbering at least 2,000. Within a week, over 326,000 troops had arrived at Normandy and the area was secured. It was no small feat. In addition to the immense manpower that the mission required, the Allies used over 5,000 ships. 50,000 vehicles, and 100,000 tons of equipment. The Germans had a number of things working against them on D-Day. Their trusted commander was away on leave, and Hitler mistakenly believed that the invasion was meant to distract his forces from an attack coming from elsewhere. So at first, he didn't let nearby soldiers join the counterattack, and instead called in reinforcements from further away. The Nazis were also impeded by the Allied airstrikes, which destroyed bridges and forced the Germans to take lengthy detours. The these are just a few of the many reasons why the tide turned largely in the favor of the Allies following the historic D-Day invasion, which proved to be a crucial step in defeating the Nazis. The Battle of Thermopylae If you've seen the movie 300, then you're at least somewhat familiar with the Battle of Thermopylae. The skirmish happened back in 480 BC in what is now central Greece during the Greco-Persian Wars. But the film, which depicts a regiment of just 300 Spartans defeating an army of over 3,000 Persian soldiers, is not exactly factual. In reality, somewhere between 2,000 and 7,000 soldiers showed up to battle the Persians, including Spartans, Helots, Thebans, and Thespians. They definitely were vastly outnumbered, to the tune of somewhere between 100,000 and 150,000 Persian warriors. For three days, the Greek forces managed to stand their ground against the army of Persian King Xerxes I by blocking the only road that the enemy thought they could pass through. But the Spartans were betrayed by one of their own, who led the Persians to an alternative pass and behind Greek lines. Spartan King Leonidas I dismissed most of his forces. He kept at least 1,000 soldiers behind to stand guard, and when the Persians approached, they battled to the death. The Spartans were ultimately defeated, but they held their ground impressively against the Persians, and they went down in history for their refusal to go down without a fight. The Battle of Gogamela Alexander the Great was one of the most powerful conquerors of all time. He became the king of Macedon at just 20 years old. By the time he was 30, he controlled one of the largest empires that ever existed, spanning from modern-day Greece to northwestern India. In 331 BC, Alexander's forces fought the Persian army under King Darius III. Known as the Battle of Gagamela or the Battle of Arbela, the skirmish took place in what is now northern Iraq. The deck was stacked heavily against the young ruler's vastly outnumbered troops. Historians estimate that there were anywhere between 52,000 and 120,000 Persian soldiers, while the Macedonian forces numbered no more than 47,000 men. Darius had recruited top-notch warriors, and his military was well-armed. He prepared for the encounter by removing plants from the battlefield and having his troops wait in formation. But Alexander used his unmatched tactical wits to outsmart the Persians. He had his infantry fight in the center of the field while riding to the edge of the right flank with his elite cavalry. This drew the Persian cavalry away from the center and created a gap within the enemy line. A fierce cavalry fight broke out. Meanwhile, Alexander's lightly armed Armed, well-trained troops defeated Darius's exposed infantry while javelin throwers intercepted Persian chariots. This three-pronged attack overwhelmed Darius and caused his army to retreat. 
the Macedonians continued to pursue the Persians and ultimately took Babylon, effectively ending the Achaemenid Empire. Darius was murdered by one of his own governors, and the betrayal reportedly didn't sit well with Alexander, who gave his worthy opponent a respectful and proper burial. White-haired skeleton in Pompeii The ruins at Pompeii were discovered during the 18th century and went on to become one of the world's most popular and well-known archaeological sites. But it's only been partially excavated, and scientists continue to make fascinating new discoveries every year. They recently unearthed the skeleton of a former slave named Marcus Venerius Secundio, who lived during the first century. He was so well preserved that some of his white hair, a part of his ear, and some clothing fragments were still attached to his body. Marcus's tomb was hermetically sealed, which helped to keep his remains intact, but at the time of his death, adults were usually cremated, making it a very unusual burial. Experts are currently trying to determine if Marcus's body was deliberately preserved. After gaining his freedom, Marcus became a priest and helped stage performances in Greek. He achieved a high social standing and lived to be around 60 years old, which was a pretty long life back then. Marcus passed away before Mount Vesuvius erupted and buried all of Pompeii in ash. His burial provided experts with the first solid evidence of the Greek language being used alongside Latin. In the words of Pompeii Archaeological Park Director Gabriel Zuchtriegel, the discovery reflects the city's lively and open cultural climate. Out of Place Mangroves Red mangrove trees grow in salt water and are generally only found in tropical coastal habitats throughout the Americas. So it's understandable that scientists were a little confused to find a collection of them 124 miles inland on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Locals have long known about the landlocked grove, but the academic community only learned of it relatively recently. Ever since, experts have been trying to figure out how the trees survive in fresh water. A team of researchers just announced that they think they've come up with an explanation. They compared the freshwater mangrove's DNA to samples from the closest coastal mangrove mangrove populations. By measuring the differences between their genomes, the team determined that the freshwater trees have been isolated for 125,000 years. At the time, global temperatures and sea levels were much higher. Scientists think that the area, which now sits far inland, was once along a coastline. When the climate cooled and the ocean receded, the trees managed to survive the transition to a freshwater environment by genetically adapting to it. The mangrove forest is home to several other ancient species that survived extreme environmental changes. It's an entire ecosystem filled with fish, turtles, other plants, and more, who somehow were able to adapt to life outside a saltwater habitat. Experts don't know how they did this and are continuing to study the site in hopes of learning more about that transitional period. A Hidden Settlement Thanks to advanced imaging technology, scientists can detect ancient settlements that are impossible to see with the naked eye. In fact, it just helped them discover a concealed neighborhood in Tikal, one of the largest ancient Mayan cities. Located in Guatemala, Tikal flourished between 200 and 900 AD, boasting an estimated 90,000 residents at its peak. A team of researchers detected the hidden settlement in an area they previously thought was a collection of natural hills. It's a landmark discovery, especially considering that Tikal was discovered back in the 1950s and has been extensively explored. But this whole part of the site has evaded detection until now. The buildings there seem to be a smaller-scale replica of the architecture at Teotihuacan, an ancient city in Mexico that was built by a mysterious culture that existed before the Aztecs. Tikal and Teotihuacan are over 621 miles away from each other, and they are different in many ways. But the similarities between the newly discovered neighborhood's buildings and those at Teotihuacan suggest that the two cities had some sort of relationship with one another, perhaps through trade. Experts are hoping that a further comparison of the sites might help them learn more about aspects of ancient life in South America that we don't know much about. Strange Radio Signal while scanning the sky for radio signals last year, Australian scientists detected a bizarre sound coming from the middle of our own galaxy. It happened just four degrees from the center and happened six times over a several-month period. 
The signal was detected one last time earlier this year, but quickly faded. A recent study identifies several possible sources for the noise, including a low dim mass star or a highly energetic object such as a pulsar or a magnetar. Is it possible that the sound came from an alien civilization? The team says it's unlikely. Study co-author Zitang Wang told Newsweek that the signals are broadband, meaning they span the entire frequency spectrum, and that this is evidence of them coming from some sort of space object. Aside from the radio burst, the source didn't emit any other type of radiation, such as high-energy x-rays, according to astronomer Matt Bothwell. He said that if it were any known object, it would have done this. But the discovery could help in the search for extraterrestrial life. Wang explained that measuring the intensity of bursts from stars that could be possible sources for the signal, researchers can look further into whether the planets that orbit around those stars are capable of hosting life. Even if aliens aren't responsible for the sound, it marks an almost equally fascinating discovery of a previously unknown cosmic phenomenon. What do you suspect the sound could be? Do you think it's coming from a dying star? Or maybe something else? Let me know in the comments below, and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. Prehistoric Golden Bowl Archaeologist Michael Sipp didn't expect to find any incredibly rare artifacts when he led excavations outside Vienna, Austria, ahead of plans to build a new train station. But his team uncovered what he would later describe as the discovery of a lifetime when they dug up a 3,000-year-old golden bowl decorated with a sun relief. Known as the Ebreichsdorf Bowl, it's pretty small, measuring just 8 inches in diameter and 2 inches high. It's made from a thin metal consisting of 90% gold, 5% silver, and 5% copper. Inside the bowl, archaeologists found two gold bracelets, some gold wire, and decomposed cloth or fabric. Speaking with the Polish press agency, Sip said that the deteriorating pieces were probably once used as decorative scarves during religious ceremonies. Similar bowls have been found elsewhere, including Spain, France, Germany, Scandinavia, and Switzerland. But this is the first bowl of its type ever to be found in Austria, and the second bowl of its kind to be found to the east of the Alpine line, according to Sip. These vessels were created by the prehistoric Urnfield culture, who began to spread throughout Europe during the 12th century BC. They were named after their tradition of burying urns full of cremation ashes in fields. In addition to the bowl, the team unearthed over 500 other artifacts, including bronze items and clay pottery. The Austrian government took possession of the bowl to ensure that it could be put on display and enjoyed by the public, rather than sold into private hands. The Well of Hell The Well of Barut, also known as the Well of Hell, is a 376-foot-deep natural sinkhole located in the remote desert of eastern Yemen. It has a reputation for bringing bad luck, so most locals avoid going near it at all costs. Some people believe that it's a prison for genies, while others think it's a gateway to the underworld. There are rumors that it will suck you in if you get too close, or that it's a supervolcano capable of destroying the world. But the less superstitious are more curious than scared of the well, and while amateur cave explorers have been known to enter it, nobody ever really traveled all the way down, until recently. Earlier this year, a group of professional cavers from the neighboring country of Oman went into the nearly 100-foot wide hole. They descended to the bottom using a pulley system that lowered eight people, while two cavers remained stationed at the top. The explorers unfortunately didn't encounter any genies, or a portal to hell, which is probably for the best. But they did report finding stalactites, stalagmites measuring up to 30 feet tall, cave pearls, waterfalls, snakes, frogs, beetles, and dead animals. Scientists are unsure how old the well to hell is, but they believe it's been around for millions of years. There is no evidence to suggest that the rumors about it being a supervolcano are true. In fact, it appears to be a typical sinkhole. It's impossible to say how the well formed, but it could have happened one of two ways. Voids in the bedrock below could have expanded to the point where the roof became unsupported and caved in. This is known as a collapsed sinkhole. It's also possible that sediments trickled from the surface into voids below and formed a depression. Either way, it seems like there is a lot more down there to be discovered, that's for sure. Mosaic Ancestor The Hittites were a Bronze Age civilization that established kingdoms as early as 1750 BC in what is now Turkey. 
they became incredibly powerful, at one point rivaling the nation of Egypt. The civilization met its downfall when the Assyrians and several other groups rose to power and began invading its territory. They burned the capital city of Hattusa to the ground, which largely erased the culture from history. What little we know about the Hittites is based on biblical mentionings and limited archaeological evidence. In 2018, archaeologists unearthed a 3,500-year-old paving stone while excavating a Hittite temple at the Ushkali Huyuk archaeological site in central Turkey. It dates back to the 15th century BC and consists of over 3,000 beige, red, and black stones arranged in a series of triangles and curves. Experts describe it as an ancestor to the mosaics that appeared hundreds of years later in ancient Greece and other places. Speaking with Fizz.org, excavation leader Anacleto D'Agostino said that the paving stone was sort of a first attempt at doing a mosaic. It's impossible to say who built the paving stone or why. As he pointed out in his own words, maybe we are dealing with a genius? Maybe not. It was maybe a man who said, build me a floor, and he decided to do something weird. Researchers believe that Ushakli Huyuk may be the lost city of Zipalanda. It was frequently mentioned in Hittite tablets as a significant place of worship, but its exact location is a mystery. Ushakli Huyuk is one of two sites that have been identified as possibly being Zipalanda. Getting to the bottom of the mystery will be difficult. Like with most other Hittite sites, most signs of the culture's presence in Turkey disappear toward the end of the Bronze Age. The Yezo Virus In recent years, a mysterious virus has been infecting people throughout parts of Japan. Scientists recently identified the pathogen, which saw its first known case in a 41-year-old man in 2019. As if we didn't have enough to worry about. He had lost his appetite, had a high fever, and was experiencing lower limb pain on both sides of his body. Just days earlier, the man had found a tick attached to his abdomen after visiting a forest near his home. Tests revealed that he had low white blood cell and platelet counts. Assuming the patient had a tick-borne disease, doctors gave him antibiotics. He spent over two weeks in the hospital and finally recovered 19 days after his symptoms started. During that time, doctors failed to identify any evidence of Lyme disease or other tick-borne illnesses. Those same experts treated another patient for similar symptoms the following year. The person had sought help at two other hospitals before going there, where they successfully recovered. Researchers detected the same virus in both patients. They managed to grow it and infect lab mice with it. Through further testing, they identified the mystery virus as a member of the orthonerovirus family, which are all spread by ticks. They named it the Yezo virus. After backtracking and testing previous patients' blood, the team found evidence of the virus going as far back as 2014. What's even more disturbing is that they believe the pathogen might be more widespread than they knew about. But before Yezo can be considered a real human illness, the findings will have to be confirmed by other experts. In the study, the team urged scientists to treat the situation with urgency and research the Yezo virus as soon as possible. Who can blame them? Nobody has died from Yezo that they know of, but the world is still reeling from the devastating effects of COVID-19. We've seen firsthand how a microscopic bug can ravage the human body, and we're still in the throes of a global pandemic. So the moral of the story? Better safe than sorry. Neanderthal Cave Chamber the Gorham's Cave Complex is a network of four sea-level caves located in the Rock of Gibraltar. It's one of the last known regions Neanderthals lived in before they went extinct. The caves were first inhabited as far back as 55,000 years ago. At the time, they were located about three miles from the Mediterranean shore. Today, only a few meters of land separate the caves from the water thanks to rising sea levels. Since 2012, archaeologists have been searching for blocked chambers and passages that have filled in with sediment. Near the back of the cave, they recently found a 42-foot chamber, along with lynx, griffin vulture, and hyena remains. The team also found scratch marks on a cave wall that were left by some type of predator. There are signs that Neanderthals entered the newly discovered chamber. A baby tooth found in the cave belonged to a four-year-old who may have been dragged into the cave by a hyena. Near the back of the chamber, the team found a large marine mollusk or a whelk. It was too far from the sea for the water to have carried it in, further pointing toward a Neanderthal presence. Speaking with CNN, Gibraltar National Museum director Clive Finlayson said that excavations at Gorham's Cave have just begun and that the team has a lot more to uncover. It could take decades to fully explore the site. Finlayson hopes to obtain Neanderthal DNA and footprints and unearth evidence that can teach us about their burial rituals. Dark Secrets at a Medieval Nunnery 
At a medieval Benedictine nunnery in Oxford, the United Kingdom, archaeologists have discovered the darkest side of convent life. During their excavations here, they uncovered just about 100 skeletons that belonged to men, women, and children. But they also uncovered some very strange burials, including one woman buried with her face down in the dirt and a small baby between her legs. The nunnery is known as the Littlemore Priory, originally founded in 1110 and then dissolved by the year 1525. According to Paul Murray with the John Moore Heritage Services, the reason this woman was buried face down probably had something to do with her perceived sins in life. In other words, the nuns buried her in such a way because being entombed in the ground with her face pressed into the dirt was considered an act of atonement, often reserved for women accused of being witches. As for the baby's burial, that remains a mystery. Nobody knows exactly what crimes this mysterious woman did or did not commit in her life. What we do know is that the nunnery had quite a controversial history. It was described in a medieval English text as in grave disorder, and even one of the worst nunneries ever. This was apparently all because of the nuns who frequently misbehaved. One of them was busted having an illegitimate daughter with one of the priests. The nunnery was embroiled in so much scandal that it had to be closed down in the early 1500s, after which it was abandoned. Creepy Stone Mask A terrifying stone mask was uncovered in an ancient pyramid by archaeologists working in Mexico. Not only is the mask green and pretty creepy, it also looks remarkably similar to the magical artifact featured in the 1994 Jim Carrey film, The Mask. A fact that internet users pounced on when pics of the discovery surfaced on Twitter. According to researchers working with the National Institute of Anthropology and History in Mexico, the mask was actually part of a ritual in which the Great Pyramid of the Sun was inaugurated in the city of Teotihuacan. This was back around the year 100 AD. The green mask was one of the artifact offerings thrown into a pit full of treasure to celebrate the pyramid's completion. The Pyramid of the Sun is the largest building in Teotihuacan, the legendary temple complex just north of Mexico City. Researchers had to dig a tunnel 380 feet long just to get to the ground level of the pyramid to where the creepy mask and other strange artifacts were found. Archaeologists also uncovered weird figurines of serpent-human hybrids, clay pottery fragments, and other miscellaneous objects. But here's the deal. The discovery was made back in the 1930s. It was just recently that pictures of the mask began circulating online, giving Teotihuacan some renewed interest. This was the largest city in the Western Hemisphere prior to the 1400s. And from between the 1st to the 5th century AD, this was one of the most populated cities in the world, with about 125,000 citizens. Ancient Egyptian Spell Archaeologists in Egypt recently discovered an ancient book inside of a sarcophagus. Both artifacts have been dated back 4,000 years, with the book being the oldest of its kind. So far, it seems to be some sort of book of spells. This creepy discovery has brought to light some interesting new information about the ancient Egyptians and how they practiced magic. This discovery was just one in a wider group of recent finds announced by the Egyptian government. In total, they found about 59 coffins in Saqqara, just south of Cairo. These coffins contained mummies, most of them wrapped in cloth with bright hieroglyphic script scribbled on their carapaces. But in one of the sarcophagi, the experts found a funerary text known only as the Book of Two Ways, a precursor to the Book of the Dead. This book contains specific instructions on how to help a departed soul navigate spiritual obstacles so that they can reach the land of the dead. Keep in mind that this book doesn't have a cover, there are no pages, and it's actually just a series of texts written on the inside of the dead person's sarcophagus. The individual died sometime around 2010 BC, during the reign of Pharaoh Mentuhotep II. The spells weren't magical incantations exactly, more like a series of rituals that needed to be performed for the deceased to reach the afterlife in one piece. Oddly enough, many of the rituals had to be performed by the dead person once they crossed over. What's really interesting is that many of these books have been found, and they are always different depending on the wealth and status of the deceased. Poor people couldn't afford to have spells scribbled inside their sarcophagi, while wealthier people could afford to have their coffins covered in as many spells as possible. Peruvian Pet Graves 
Archaeological investigators in Peru have discovered evidence of an ancient culture who loved their pet dogs so much that they built pet cemeteries for them. According to anthropologist Sonia Guillén, these ancient people never sacrificed their dogs, but instead buried them in lavish style as a way to recognize contributions the dogs had made to their society and their family. Since 1993, at least 82 dog tombs have been found in various pet cemeteries throughout the Osmore River Valley, about 540 miles south of the capital of Lima. But just who were these dog-loving people? They were known as the Chiribaya, an ancient culture of farmers who thrived from between 900 AD to 1350 AD, before the Inca Empire came into power. They were a quiet society, keeping to themselves mostly as they toiled on their farms and tried to survive. The dogs they used to help in their everyday lives may be the ancestors of modern Peruvian dogs. Nobody's been able to prove it yet, but genetics researchers are currently working to connect the dots between the ancient Chiribaya dog breed to animals like the modern Peruvian hairless dog. If you could, would you bury your dog in its very own tomb? Or would you want to be buried with your dog? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Lost Tunnel Electrical technicians in South Wales made a surprising and creepy discovery in someone's backyard while working for Western Power Distribution and moving an electrical pole. As the techs worked to relocate the pole, which was in someone's garden, they were startled as it was revealed they had broken through into a tunnel system that had been hidden since the 12th century. What makes the tunnel so interesting is that nobody knew it existed, not the local residents or the local authorities. And it was creepy, completely dark, like some kind of forgotten tomb. Work had to be stopped and archaeologists were called in to investigate, bringing with them maps of the small village that date all the way back to the 18th century. But the tunnel system was not on any of their maps, and to make matters even more complicated, the tunnels eventually get so narrow that the only way through is to crawl. Nobody knows where they end up or who built them, and it could take years of investigating before the mystery of the tunnels is solved. Imagine all of the creepy reasons a tunnel system like that could have been dug. The Death Whistle The Aztec Death Whistle is by far one of the creepiest musical instruments, if it can even be called that, from the ancient world. The sound made by the Aztec Death Whistle is arguably one of the most frightening sounds that you'll ever hear in your life. It sounds like a zombie opened up its mouth and started screaming. And that's just one whistle. The Aztec army, when marching towards the enemy, may have blown hundreds or even thousands of these things. The resulting noise would have been enough to leave the opposing army nervous, scared, and feeling like they were about to be slaughtered by a literal army of demons. However, nobody actually knows what the Aztec society used these whistles for. Experts say it makes sense that they were an intimidation technique for war, but there's been no proof of this. The only proof is that the whistles were definitely used in human sacrifice. This is because in 1999, a sacrificial victim was uncovered by archaeologists. In his skeletal hand, he clutched an Aztec death whistle. The experts found him inside the temple of Ejecatl, the Aztec wind god. This has led some scholars to wonder if the whistles weren't meant to evoke the fury of the howling wind. Yikes. A prehistoric burial. Scientists have uncovered a mysterious child burial from 78,000 years ago in a Kenyan cave. The child was no older than three years old at the time of their death, though experts can't figure out yet if the child was a male or a female. What makes the discovery so unique is that the child was buried in a ritualistic style, with their body carefully wrapped in cloth, then placed in the grave on their side with their knees tucked up against their chest. They were then covered with dirt and left just a few inches beneath the floor of the cave. According to Nicole Boyvin, an archaeologist with the Max Planck Institute in Germany, the burial was probably a group act. It may have been performed by members of the child's family. This is fascinating because it's one of the earliest examples of a family getting together to bury their dead, while showing the same level of respect for the deceased that we show our dead loved ones today. And this was 78,000 years ago, at a time when humans were still living in caves. Finding the bones of a dead child deep inside a cave is definitely creepy, but the more complex truth behind the burial is heartwarming. It shows a deep appreciation for human life back before any major civilization had even been born. Archaeologists are still struggling to find out when funeral behavior began, 
Though it seems Homo sapiens and our relatives, the Neanderthals, both practiced it. A very old toilet. Archaeologists have discovered something pretty creepy in an entirely different way. A toilet from 2,700 years ago. The ancient potty was found inside the ruins of a palace in Israel, what had once been a luxury abode up in the mountains, with a clear view of Jerusalem's Temple Mount. Archaeologists don't know who owned the palace, but it was definitely somebody of extreme wealth. It may have been a member of elite society, perhaps even a king. Whatever the case, the presence of a private toilet in this ancient palace has proven a theory that only the richest members of society could afford their own toilet thousands of years ago. For the rest of society, they were stuck with public toilets or simply doing their business in the ditches beside the road. From what Yaakov Bilig has said, the director of the excavation that discovered the toilet, only a handful have been discovered from the first temple period of Israel. And in most cases, they weren't even really toilets. They were just toilet seats. But this time, the archaeologists found a full cabin made of stone with a toilet seat and a hole carved in the middle. It was designed to be extremely comfortable, and there was even a tank beneath the toilet for collecting waste. The toilet would have also been used as a garbage, since people weren't that fussy about what they did with their trash thousands of years ago. A Giant Penguin In New Zealand, a 10-year-old boy discovered the fossil of a giant penguin while on a field trip. Sure, penguins might seem cute and cuddly today, but millions of years ago, these things were frightening. The child was on a fossil hunting field trip in Kawia Harbor when he spotted what he at first thought was a rusty propeller. But upon closer inspection, he and his teacher realized they were staring at a fossil encased in sandstone. The specimen was taken back for analysis, with scientists later finding out its identity. The skeleton is that of a giant species of penguin that lived 30 million years ago. The creature stood nearly five feet tall, almost larger than the kid who found its fossil. And amazingly, it was discovered to be an entirely new species, a type of penguin that lived in New Zealand at a time when the whole region was underwater. But what makes this flightless bird so strange? It looked just like any other penguin, except it had weirdly long legs that made it ridiculously tall. It was even taller than the largest living penguins we have on Earth right now, the emperor penguin. The tallest emperor penguin is only about four feet, and this ancient species was nearly a foot taller. What do you think about giant penguins? Let me know in the comments below. Cat fur clothes. In a truly bizarre discovery, archaeologists have found evidence that human beings were making clothes out of cat skin about 120,000 years ago. Most of us know that our ancestors made their clothes from animals, but we usually think of them utilizing deer skins and making leather from wild cattle. The truth is a little stranger. Humans from the Pleistocene era living in what is modern-day Morocco were catching cats, skinning them, and then using their cat fur to make all manner of clothing. To make things even more bizarre, archaeologists found evidence that they had also been butchering bovids at the time, but instead only using them to produce meat. In other words, they were hunting wild cattle and eating them, while hunting wild cats and making shirts and pants out of them. And to make matters worse for our feline friends, this practice likely went on up until just recently, maybe 15 or 10,000 years ago. This means that our ancient ancestors wore cat skins as clothing for a period of over 100,000 years. What do you think about cat fur? Let me know in the comments below. The Maya Underworld According to Maya legend, the entrance to the terrifying underworld, the very realm of the afterlife, is located deep inside the earth in Belize, specifically in the Chiquipul cave system, where archaeologists have uncovered some of the most disturbing sites of human sacrifice ever. In the old Maya language, the underworld was known as Hibalba, which translates roughly to the place of fright. It was where the most fearsome deities from Maya mythology lived, such as the Lord of Death. The underworld was said to have rivers of venomous scorpions, a house filled with killer jaguars, and plenty of other terrifying things. The recently dead were supposed to be confronted by tests of courage and strength upon their entrance to the underworld. But here's where things get archaeological. Evidence has shown a dramatic increase in the cave sacrifices given to the demonic gods of the underworld starting around the year 900 AD. The Maya had always been enthusiastic, let's say, about sacrificing people, 
but something happened around 900 that caused them to start bringing mass amounts of people down into the caves to be sacrificed. We also know that this was right around the time of the great civilization's collapse. They were undone by years of unprecedented droughts, which ultimately brought down their agricultural economy and caused political upheaval. So, as the Maya people were migrating from their great cities into the countryside, running away from famine and death, the great priests were busy toiling in the lair of the gods in Chiquibul, trying to sacrifice as many people as it took to appease the Lord of the Dead and bring stability back to their civilization. Egypt's Mountain of the Dead Deep in the Egyptian desert, there is a place called the Siwa Oasis. Within this oasis is the Mountain of the Dead, one of the most ghoulish archaeological sites in the world. The mountain contains heaps of tombs pocked across its surface. The tombs cover just about every single inch of the mountain. You can't walk five feet without stepping on somebody's grave. Some burials date back all the way to the 26th dynasty, while more recent burials are from the Greek and Roman periods. Arguably, the most famous tomb on the Mountain of the Dead is that of Si Amun, which dates back to the 3rd century BC. We are not quite sure who he was since it looks like he held no official titles, but his tomb clearly shows that he was wealthy and important. He may have been a Greek landowner or merchant, but he certainly followed the Egyptian religion. It was first officially discovered in October of 1940, but was heavily damaged by the soldiers who were excavating the mountain. Plus, the tomb had already been robbed hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. The exact origin of the mountain is a little vague, as thousands of years of pillaging and neglect have left it in rough shape. Before modern times, the local villagers had even made their homes inside of the tombs. Most of them hardly even look like tombs anymore, as they are filled with garbage and there are animal bones inside them. While still a pretty disturbing experience to climb a literal mountain of the dead, this site has not been kept very well preserved. Lamanai Ruins The Lamanai Maya ruins in Belize date back to around the year 1500 BC. Amazingly, the site was occupied until at least 1680 AD. That's over 3,000 years, with the local people growing maize in the old bones of the city long after it was deserted. The ruins were discovered in modern times in 1978 by archaeologists who were able to identify it as the ancient city of the submerged crocodile. The archaeologists found figurines, pottery decorations, and a large number of crocodile images. Basically, the main theme here was crocodiles. The core of the site today is about 12 square miles and includes a whole heap of structures, including 12 major buildings, a ball court, and three key temples – the Mask Temple, the Jaguar Temple, and the High Temple. But here's why it's such a dark archaeological place. It was one of the worst cities in the Maya world for human sacrifice. Even the ball court was a place of great death. The objective of the game here was to hit a small ball through a stone hoop, kind of like sideways basketball. The winners were given a marvelous feast, but the losers were put to death. Out of all of the temples here, the Mask Temple is definitely the strangest. It dates back to about 550 AD and was probably the seat of the Maya kings that ruled the city. Archaeologists even found a mysterious limestone mask with a crocodile headdress, though they have no idea what its purpose was, most likely to scare the daylights out of everyone. The Paris Catacombs The Paris Catacombs are one of the most terrifying and darkest places anywhere in Europe. The catacombs may not be the most famous landmark in Paris, but they are certainly the spookiest. This is a system of underground tombs filled with hundreds of thousands of human bones. The tunnels go on for over 200 miles, originally part of a quarry dug by miners. The catacombs weren't meant to be used for holding human remains. It just kind of turned out that way. It all happened in the 18th century when Paris realized that their cemeteries were way too overcrowded. People in the city were complaining about the odor of death wafting out of the cemeteries and filling the city streets. People also started to get sick because they were in such close contact with the dead. To fix this problem, the Parisians started moving bodies out of the cemeteries and hiding them underground in the catacombs. This started in 1785, with the corpses being moved under the cover of night so that the locals didn't get upset about the grisly scene. Bodies continued to be transferred into the catacombs all the way until the French Revolution. In 1860, the name changed from the Paris Municipal Ossuary to the catacombs. 
Today, you can go down there yourself and see the bones of the six million people entombed underneath the streets of the City of Love. Have you already been here? Or do you want to go? Let me know in the comments below. The Cave of the Altamura Man There is a cave in southern Italy that is absolutely grotesque. Caves are hideous and dark enough as it is, without human bones growing out of the walls. I'm talking about the cave where the Altamura Man was found, one of the best preserved Neanderthal skeletons ever discovered by scientists. This guy's fossilized bones remained hidden for about 130,000 years at the bottom of a sinkhole near the southern Italian town of Altamura. He was first discovered by cavers in 1993, though scientists have had a much more difficult time reaching this spooky skeleton because of his precarious position. His bones are stuck deep through the narrow crevices at the very bottom of the sinkhole. Studying his remains had been extremely challenging, not to mention nobody really wants to go down there because it's dark and terrifying. According to Jacopo Mojicecchi, a professor from the Department of Biology at the University of Florence, the Neanderthal probably fell down a shaft by accident and then died either upon impact or shortly after. Then his bones just kind of melded into the cave wall. They are covered today in calcite mineral deposits that make it look as though he has tiny teeth growing out of his bones. They are so firmly stuck at the bottom of the sinkhole that archaeologists doubt they'll ever be able to extract the bones without damaging them. Would you dare climb down into this spooky cave to see the preserved bones of a Neanderthal? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. We have lots more videos like these coming up. Alexandria's Black Sarcophagus in the Egyptian city of Alexandria, archaeologists made an extremely grim discovery. They uncovered the largest stone coffin ever found in Alexandria, a huge black sarcophagus estimated to weigh over 30 tons. It was one of the most haunting artifacts ever unearthed in the city, and some warned scientists it was better off being left in the ground where it was found. Some claimed it was cursed. Some say that opening the great black sarcophagus would end the world and some even believed the sarcophagus held the body of an extremely powerful mummy, one that might just come back to life, or wreak havoc around everyone around it. This strange discovery only got weirder when archaeologists opened the coffin to discover a trio of human bodies floating inside a red soup. It looked like a witch's cauldron filled with raw red sewage and human bones. Yet despite how gross the liquid was, literally human soup, an online petition sprang up where people asked the Egyptian authorities if they could drink a vial of the red liquid to gain special powers. Would you drink the liquid from an ancient Egyptian mummy coffin? Let me know in the comments. Nobody ever did drink the liquid, officially, so we don't know if it contained any magical powers. But after the hype died down, scientists were able to announce the bodies belonged to a woman and two men, probably from around the year 332 BC but scientists still can't figure out why all three of them were buried inside of a great black sarcophagus. Very unique back in those days. The Haunted Bangar Fort In India, the Banghar Fort is considered one of the most haunted places in the entire country. It's a disturbing archaeological site that may just have a few skeletons in its many closets. Visitors report being besieged by a sense of anxiety and suffering from sudden paranoia upon entering the ruins. The fortress dates back to the 17th century, with its creation being tied closely to a curse. When the king decided to build the fort, there was a bit of an issue because the location chosen happened to be the favorite spot of a local hermit. The king went to the hermit and said that he was going to build the fort, and the hermit said it would be perfectly fine so long as no shadow from the fortress fell upon him. The king agreed to the terms, but after construction, a shadow from the building fell right over the hermit's little house. Since the deal was broken, the hermit cursed the Bangar fort, which ultimately led to the nearby village being destroyed, and the massive fort left abandoned. While this may sound like a silly story from legend, the locals take it very seriously. To this day, it is forbidden to enter the fortress at night because of the supposed paranormal activity that goes on. Even the Archaeological Survey of India has posted signs all along the fort that warn visitors to stay off the premises between sunset and sunrise. They say those who try to spend a night within the confines of the ruins, well, they never come out again. San Franciscan Monastery in Lima 
In the heart of Lima, the capital of Peru, there is the St. Francis Monastery. It's a church, a monastery, a library, and also a spooky graveyard. The church and monastery were both blessed in 1673. After that, the structure experienced quite a bit of trouble. There was a major earthquake in 1687 and another one in 1746. When another earthquake struck in 1970, the church suffered extensive damage, but it was rebuilt every time and still stands today. One of the most impressive parts of the monastery is its library, which holds about 25,000 antique texts. Many of these texts actually predate the Spanish conquest. But you probably want to get to the dark part of the site. It's located underneath the main floor of the monastery, down in the catacombs where there are 25,000 bodies hiding inside the crypts. The crypts were discovered in 1943, over 150 years after they were used for burying the dead. The catacombs existed in secret beneath the monastery, used hundreds of years ago as discreet passageways between the cathedral and the tribunal of the Holy Inquisition. In other words, the main priests at the monastery used the catacombs to sneak around, doing whatever shifty things they did during the horrible evil of the Spanish Inquisition. The Village of Herxheim Herxheim is a terrifying mystery that has taken the scientific community by storm. This place is located in southwest Germany, with archaeologists finding evidence of human habitation here going back to 5300 BC. It was initially described as an idyllic settlement from the Stone Age. The houses were quaint, they had rudimentary plots of farming land, and they seemed to be safe from invaders and dangerous natural predators but the archaeologists found evidence that the people of the village vanished abruptly in 4950 BC. The town was literally abandoned overnight. And while researchers haven't been able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt what happened, they believe a violent spout of cannibalism may have had something to do with it. In 2009, archaeologists uncovered a mass grave here, complete with at least 500, though perhaps as many as 1,000, human remains. The bones belong to men, women, children, infants, everybody. But to make the discovery extra dark, the bones showed evidence of tool markings. By inspecting these markings, archaeologists determined that the flesh had been carefully scraped off the bones, probably to be eaten. Plus, many of the skulls had been cracked open like eggs to more easily extract the yummy brains inside. Scientists have absolutely no idea why the village fell apart with the citizens evidently eating one another. It could have been some kind of plot for human sacrifices gone wrong. Nobody really knows. All the experts can say for sure is that the entire village was eaten in a very short time. The Lothian Cemetery The Christian burial ground of the Lothian Cemetery was established back in 1808 and used until the 1960s. European soldiers were buried here during the Battle of Independence in 1857 and so were British women and children living in India who died during the Great Cholera Epidemic. The cemetery is full of the bodies of the British, which is bizarre because it's located at Kashmir Gate in India. The cemetery is left over from the time of the British occupation, and to this very day, it holds some very haunting secrets. One of the darkest secrets of the Lothian Cemetery is that the dead sometimes wander around at night. Visitors to the cemetery have reported seeing a headless ghost meandering around the graveyard. Not only is this a place of great importance to the historical tale of India and Britain, it's also full of headless ghosts. Thanks for watching! Which of these terrifying places would you love to explore? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you haven't already, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more. See you later! Bye!